Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and the tents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves through the study of God's word, through the, uh, through the concept of uh, confession and operation cry. 1 John 1, 9 and Romans 6, 6, 6, 11 and 6, 13. All of you who are online with me right now understand that. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I'll close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we left off on yesterday morning. Head bowed and eyes closed. Father, I'm just about at a loss for words when I look at the news and I see uh, the way that the news is being reported. And then today we turn on the television and there is our governor from the state of Arkansas with Chris Wallace being asked questions that were just baited kind of questions. And to hear the answer that was given to those questions by our governor, it just as though he skirted the issue. And then when it came right down to the real question that was going to be asked of him, he indicated that what happened in Washington, D.C. by the storming of the state capitol was actually caused by our present president. It's amazing, Father. The lies, the deceit, the worry, the pressure, the anxiety, the harangue, the misdirection, and all other things that coming from the evil one, Satan, who's the ruler of the world, so influencing people in our society today that within about a 24 hour period, if you do not if you do not divinely intervene, there is not a more appropriate passage of scripture for all of us than the passage that we're studying right now. Because the question is, how are we in the midst of pressure, persecution, whatever you want to call it, Father, whatever it's going to be named, the question is, how are we who have been studying the Word of God all these years, how are we going to handle the circumstance and be objective about this and not whine and gripe and complain like we indicated yesterday that the Jews did when they got into the wilderness. Father, it's so easy to live the Christian way of life and be spiritual, quote unquote, when things are going our way or when the pressure's on someone else and not on us. But Father, that's not the way, that's not the way that life works. You know that and I know that. So as we continue our study of chapter 6 of Ephesians, Father, I'm grateful for Paul giving us this information. And what an example that man was. Not just of positional righteousness, but of experiential righteousness. And oh, that's okay for Paul. No, that's okay for us. That's the way we are to live. For the same mentality that Jesus faced the cross, for the same mentality that that Peter faced his persecution. And my goodness, well, how many, how many people did I talk about yesterday, Father? Was it about 15 people? Where we looked at the disciples and how they were martyred 
how they were tortured and persecuted well that doesn't happen when we're not when we're not living the christian way of life when we're just waving at the christian way of life and not taking a stand but look we need to get on with the study father so that we'll have more information by tomorrow night and midnight because we don't know what's going to happen after that we know what's going to happen historically but we don't know what how that's going to work out so may we give attention to what i'm going to teach tonight and i'll praise you for it in christ's name amen well our passage our passage is ephesians uh six 16 through 18. We've now been in verse 16, I think, for three sessions. And I thought that probably a week ago I'd be we'd be finished with Ephesians, but the longer we go, the more we get, and the more appropriate it is for the time in which we live. So let's go on and move into our passage of scripture then. And again, with just a bit of background, going back to verse 13 again. Verses 13 through 16 are, are talking about the equipment that we need to live the Christian way of life. This is not something that uh, is just out there for sale. This equipment is not something that's just out there and say, well, you know, if you ever get around to it, that'll be perfectly okay. Pick it up and use it if you want to. Now, you may find something better out there for the circumstance of like, no, you won't. No, you won't. This is the angelic conflict, and, and, the, and God the Father saw this in eternity past and said, hey, for this day, how about this? January 18th, 2021, at about seven minutes after, just about two seconds before eight minutes after seven, the circumstance that we face today said, hey, this is what you're going to need. So in verse 13, because of the angelic conflict, God tells us through Paul, pick up and put on. Remember we talked about two things there? You can pick it up and not put it on. You, can, you can't put it on without picking it up. But we've got some things here that we need to pick up. That means take hold of these things and begin to use them. And what are we going to do? Put on the full armor of God. Not a few pieces, but the whole full armor of God. That's the full armor, not of God, the full armor from God. God's made these provisions. And the full armor is a part of his grace provision for you and me. So he says, in order that, here's why, here's why we're supposed what we're supposed to be doing with this. We're actually going to be, we're actually going to be taking this and using it in the spiritual battle. So he said, put on the full armor of God in order that you might have the ability to resist in the evil day. Now, notice again the, uh, the, uh, the, the conditionality here. We're going to pick it up and put it on in order that we might have. You will have the ability. You will have the ability to resist in the evil day if, in fact, you pick up and put on the full armor of God. But if you if you don't pick it up and you don't put it on, or you pick up part of it and don't put it all on, guess what? There will be no complete ability to resist in the evil day. And what are we resisting? We're resisting all of the all of the the evil, the evil principles, the evil thoughts, the uh, the practice of evil that is being forced upon us as human beings by other human beings under the influence of Satan. So he says, look here, he says, pick up the full armor of God in order that you might have the ability and see that might have is dependent upon your attitude toward the word of God, which indicates you must be saved. You must be clean before the Lord. You must be taking in the word of God. You must be applying the word of God and all that with the exception of salvation, rebound and moving into the uh, into the sphere of the spirit everything else is a matter of an application and a walk in the sphere of the spirit so we're going to put on the whole armor of god in order that we might be able to oppose the forces of satan and that's listen what okay so what are the forces of satan let's go back here We've indicated 
that the lifestyle of the Christian in the sphere of the spirit is to think like Jesus thinks, feel like Jesus feels, speaks like Jesus speaks, and do like Jesus does. Well, guess what? If we're going to be, uh, if we are going to be battling the forces of evil, the forces of Satan, then what he's going to do, he's going to bring us information that will be just the contrary to that. It'll be the thinking of man. It'll be the speech of man. It'll be the feelings of man. It'll be doing the doing the things the way that people do it. Who are not in the sphere of the spirit. Who are not saved. Then in verse 14, now he tells us, look, these are the things you need to do. You need to pick up this full armor. And he says, now here's the, here's the stand fast. There it is. And if we think the wind has been blowing in the last week, the last two weeks, the last three years, the last four years, we haven't seen anything the likes of what is going to be blowing after January 20th. Now let me point out something. I can say what I'm saying to you because you've come to the point of realizing that I'm teaching the Word of God. I'm not teaching my thinking. I'm not giving you some conspiracy theory. But when you are able to connect the dots, realizing from the Word of God all that is going on that is contrary to the principles of the Word of God, and you see this trail going here, 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 and there, you can see the path that it's taking, and when you realize what the scripture says about the last days, and I'm not indicating that we're there, only that what is going on today has the same quality and the same effect that the last days are going to have in the, day, in the age of grace, but the question is one of quantity, not quality. On a scale of one to 10, how close are we to the rapture of the church in the last days? Well, I'll tell you what, we know this. We are one day closer than we were yesterday. So when the wind begins to blow, the storms of life begin to blow, the question is, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Took a little longer now. Where are you? Here it is. Tornadic winds of time blowing against your life. Paul says, stand fast. Therefore, after having buckled around your waist the belt of truth. Now look here. I've got this uh, this picture of this Roman soldier over here, and he has the armor of God. And I don't know that except unless you blow that picture up where you could actually read it. But what we see here are there are some arrows on this on this uh, this picture that are pointing to the particular piece of armor that Paul is talking about. So the belt of armor is just about his waist there, and that's the belt of truth. So you're going to put on the belt of truth. So if you're going to if you're going to put on the full armor of God, you need the belt of truth, and that's exactly what you're getting while you come to Bible class. So the issue for you tonight is not looking so much at yourself, because the truth of the matter is that probably every one of you online with me understand the importance of the word of God in your life. Now, how much you're applying is between you and the Lord. But you know how important the word of God is because you have been in Bible class every time the word of God has been taught. And even in, in addition to that, some of you are logging on with other pastors that you can trust and that I trust. And that's perfectly okay because you're getting their idea in another, in other words, I'm preaching, 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 I'm teaching Ephesians. Al Rosenblum might be teaching Colossians. Steve Ellis may be teaching Revelation. Mark Goad is someplace out in the Old Testament. I'm not sure where, where Brad West is, but they, listen, there are a number of people out here. And men other than what I'm, and how about, how about Mike Smith down in, down in Brenham, Texas? And listen, if they are if they are teaching at some time and you're free, I don't have any problem with you line, uh, getting on, on with them. Just make sure that when you're listening to them, we're all saying the same thing. And if they're not, if we're not, you better ask the question why. So here's the belt of truth. And see, that's that thing right around this guy's waist right here. 
I can't mark it off. I, I, I can't mark it, but you can see it right around his waist. That's the belt of truth. That that is we're not gonna put we're not gonna put a belt on, but the truth of the matter is the, the belt in the Roman military uh, equipment field, the belt is what held everything else together. But guess what? Doctrine is the is the, the thing in our life that's going to help hold everything else together. So the first thing that Paul says, look, if you're going to put on the armor, you need to put on the you need to put on the belt of truth. And that's doctrine in your soul, not just in the Bible. No, it, it, you don't have on the belt of truth if you just got it right here. If you just got it in your hand. No, that's that's not it. That's not enough. You have to have it up here in the right lobe of your mentality, right up here. Now, with that in mind, he goes on to say then, now that you have the belt of truth, also, meaning in addition to the belt of truth, having put on the body armor of experiential righteousness. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to be saved. You have to be living in the sphere of the spirit, which means you're functioning from the source of the new man or the new woman, and you need to be applying the truth to the circumstances of life. Now you not only have the belt of truth, you're using that truth and an application out here in the sphere of the spirit, and you are not only positionally righteous, you are experientially righteousness and righteous, and that means that you are actually doing the things that Jesus wants you to do. You're thinking like he thinks, feeling like he feels, speaking like he speaks, and doing like he does. That's experiential righteousness when you're living in the sphere of the spirit. And then going for on from there, see, that's two things. Then he goes on to the third thing and says, having put on the boots on your feet. Now, I, now, I guess, but let me come back here for just a minute. Now, so look here. Here's the body armor. That's this big shield here. And we were telling you yesterday that the word for uh, the word for body armor here, this the shield. It looks like a door. Do the big, a big door-like thing. So what are you doing when the enemy throws a rock at you? This, this is what the police do today. The police have a face mask, but they've also got this body armor. They've got this thing in their hand, and it blocks things that are being thrown at them, shot at them. So that's the body armor, and that's protecting the body, the, the entirety of you, your body. And there's your experiential righteousness. From the top of your head to the foot of your, uh, bottom of your feet, you are experientially righteous, everything about you. Now you're going to put, you're going to do something else. Now you're going to go into battle. And you're going to go through the marches. You're going to go through the, the stubble fields, the right field, rice fields. You're going to go up the mountain. You're going to be walking in the desert. And you put on your combat boots. So you're putting on your boots so you can go somewhere, go somewhere, go somewhere. Your, your boots are going to allow you to go wherever you need to go. And you are in a spiritual battle. That's why they're called combat boots, the angelic conflict. And you put these on your feet because you are going to be traveling. You're going to be going to work. You're going to go to store. You're going to go to assemble with people when COVID-19 is not here and as we did in the past. You travel here. You're going to travel there. Well, listen. You're putting on. You're putting on your com the combat boots on your feet, with that you are prepared with the readiness of the gospel of peace. And we've indicated the gospel of peace there is peace with God at salvation and the peace of God when you're doing the right thing in the right way. And as you grow to spiritual maturity, when you when you break into spiritual adulthood, you are now able to to begin to. Uh, to experience the peace of God in every circumstance of life. And let me point out this. When it come, when when the 20th of January gets here, if all things go in the manner in which I believe they're going to go, if there is not divine inter intervention tonight or all day tomorrow, by midnight tomorrow night, if it hasn't happened, if God has not intervened, when the circumstances of life begin to blow up, and if you've been reading the news, I'm not talking about fake news. I'm talking if you if you have been reading the news and not just the conspiracy theories out there that have taken you out into la la land. I'm talking about realizing 
what these people who will be in power are telling you they're going to do, what they might be going to do, and realizing how that's going to, to dissipate your freedom, dissipate our freedom, diminish our ability to be able to contact one another with the word of God in multiple means. And in fact, in my life right now, I've, I've been... been to how I am going to be able to continue to communicate the word of God with you after January the 20th. And we may find out that everything goes along smoothly for a while. But if the group that will be in power has their own way, my mouth, our mouths will be shut down. We will not be able to, to, to meet again, even in distance like this. And when you go back, when you go back into ancient times in the past, you have to realize that under certain well, it hadn't even been any in the in the distance past, distant past. You have to realize that there were people in hiding meeting to worship together because you could not do this in public and let it be known. Isn't amazing? So my question is this. If you're going to if you're going to shod your feet, you're going to put on your combat boots with a readiness of the gospel, which means you're going to take the you're going to take the gospel to people. That is, you're going to be able to evangelize. That's our ambassadorship. And if we're going to be faithful in our ambassadorship, we need to be willing to tell people about Jesus. And I will guarantee you this: that as if things ramp up the way I believe they're going to, if with there's no divine intervention. Listen, we are going to have the opportunity to evangelize multiple, multiple, multiple people who have absolutely no clue about life. But when the pressure comes, they're going to be looking for an answer. Are you ready to stand? And when you do, you need to be standing not just with a, not with a gospel, but you need to present them with a gospel of peace because there are going to be millions of born-again Christians who, who themselves are falling apart right now based on what they're not sure what's going to happen two days from now. Oh, the opportunity is going to be fantastic. So in addition to all these, truth, experiential righteousness, gospel of peace, he said, having picked up that metabolized, now listen, he said, in addition to these, having picked up, that's metabolized gnosis, metabolizing gnosis. That means you're taking in the word of God. It's gnosis information in the frame of reference, goes down to the human spirit, back up to the frame of reference. You believe it. Now you have epinosis. So having picked up and put on the shield of faith, that's metabolizing doctrine, and you're taking it in, and you are, you're actually uh, uh, applying it. You pick it up, and you put it on. And what are you putting on? You're putting on the shield of faith. With which shield of faith, you, royal family members, you will have the ability to, to extinguish, destroy all flaming missiles, every tactic of the evil one who is Satan. Now, what do we learn? And this is where we pick up now. What do we learn from this verse 16? Well, first of all, the combination of Bible doctrine in your soul. Now, what that means is you've taken in the word of God. You've metabolized it. You've believed it. It's down. It's down in your uh, in your uh, on the launching platform. It's in your soul. See the launching platform's up here. It's a part of your. It's a part of your soul, and the combination of doctrine in your soul. There it is, plus faith number two, which is doctrine applied. So when you have the doctrine in your soul and you actually apply that doctrine, that is the basis for protecting yourself against Satan's weapons, against Satan's tactics. So this bullet point now, what we're going to do is expand that and, and sort of give this in another way. What you remember? Faith one, faith two, and faith three. You Listen, if you don't remember those, you've got a problem. You have a problem because these are principles from the word of God that are going to help you to understand all the parts of the of scripture, all the parts of the principles, the promises, doctrines, techniques, rules for living. These are going to help you. But listen, you can't put the pieces of the puzzle together if you don't understand the piece of that puzzle. 
So we've indicated there are three different categories of faith. Faith one, faith two, and faith three. Faith one is when the word of God's coming in and it gets up to the uh, gets up into your frame of reference. The Holy Spirit's given you the information. He's taught you what this means. Now the question is, are you going to believe that? Now, when you when you believe that, that's faith number one. You have manifested faith directed toward the Word of God. So you've already you've already had faith toward Jesus Christ. That's why you're saved. But now that you're saved, that's not the end. You have to have another object of your faith in order to be able to grow. And that's the Word of God being taught by your pastor teacher. So faith one is believing what has been taught, what the Holy Spirit teaches you. Faith two is the application from the launching pad of what you have already believed. That's the gnosis, that's the epinosis information on the launching pad that's being applied to the circumstance of life. Faith three is the body of doctrine. That's the principles, the promises, doctrines, techniques, and rules for living. And a, princi a single principle can be faith, faith three. It might be one promise, faith three. It might be a rule for living, that's faith three. It might be a technique, that's faith three. So whether it's a principle, promise, doctrine, technique, or rule for living, that's all the word of God. That's the inspired and errant and infallible word of God. That's faith three, and that's what you're applying. That's what you're taking in. That's what you're metabolizing. So when you take faith three that's coming in, and you believe it, plus your application, so the Bible, the Bible that you're metabolizing, plus faith, believing it, and faith to apply it, therein lies your protection against all the Satan's fiery darts. You see, faith three equals doctrine in the Bible, any doctrine. And at that point in the Bible, it's no more than gnosis information. You haven't believed it. There it is. It's no, it's in the Bible. You haven't heard it before. You've never been taught that. All of a sudden, the pastor opens the Bible, says, "Hey, here's the, here's what it says. This is what it means." And the Spirit of God confirms that. Well, here's faith three right here, but you've got to get faith three up here. Now, when you have it up there, the question: How do you get it? It's because when it was taught, you believed it. That's faith one. Then the circumstance comes along, guess what? You apply that, and now you have your protection against Satan and his fiery darts in that, in that situation. So faith three is any doctrine in the Bible, and that's gnosis information until it's believed. But when you believe it, that's faith number one, doctrine believed. And that converts gnosis information into full knowledge. See, gnosis is knowledge, not belief. Gnosis information plus faith one equals epinosis. That's doctrine now that's on the launching pad. And number faith number two then is applying that doctrine on the launching pad that's consistent with the circumstance of life. So what happens is faith three plus faith one plus faith two, what does that do? That equals protection against any and all Satan's fiery darts. Here's how you live the Christian way of life. Point number two, the great overall principle of this verse. What is verse? What is this verse? Verse 16 is, is the one we're in right now. And it says, in addition to all these, having picked up and you get the whole, uh, you get the, the first three parts of God's armor, the armor, the armor that comes from God. So the great overall principle of this verse, what's he what's he talking to us about? Here it is. Here's the overall principle. There is no power which belongs to Satan, which is great enough to destroy any believer who is holding the shield of faith. And what is the shield of faith? It's faith three, Bible doctrine, coming in, faith one, believing it, faith two, applying it, and therein is your shield of faith. Your shield of faith is faith three plus faith one plus faith two. There is your body armor. There's your shield of faith. Now in point number two, you must carry the shield, and I'm going to put a D on that. You must carry the shield of faith with you wherever you go. No matter where you go. You're moving around in the house. You go from the bedroom to the bathroom, to the kitchen, to the study. Where are you going? Where are you going in the house? 
wherever you're going and you're outside the house. You go, you go, you go, where are you going? You're going to go to school. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to, you're going to go to the store. Wherever you go, you must carry the shield of faith with you. And what is the shield of faith? Faith three plus faith one plus faith two, because now you have everything you need to, to, to uh, shield yourself against the fiery darts of Satan in, in, the, in the store, on the street, on the job, in the school, wherever you happen to be, riding down the street. Where are you? No matter where you go, you take the shield of faith with you. See, putting on the full armor of God. Now that coming back here to this picture right there, there's your picture. You see the shield. We've seen the, we've seen the belt. We've seen the experiential righteousness. We've seen the shield of faith. Now we're going to move on from there. Now, in point number three, you see the accumulation of doctrine, the accumulation of principles and promises and doctrines and techniques and rules for living, the accumulation of doctrine resonant in your soul. That means you're coming to Bible class today. You came last week. You came a month ago. You came a year ago. You came a decade ago. You've been coming just about a millennium. Not that long. I understand. But the accumulation of doctrine, which is truth, see, there's the belt of truth. The accumulation of doctrine resonant in your soul relates to the function of the faith rest technique. If you don't have doctrine resonant in your soul, there is no way that you or I or we could function in the faith rest technique. So you're applying the faith rest technique, you're going to need an accumulation of doctrine resonant in your soul. So the accumulation of doctrine, which is truth, resonant in your soul, it's not in the Bible, it's not in the book anymore, it's up here in your head, you've metabolized it all the way to the, all the, way to the launching pad. So what we see then from that is this, as you accumulate doctrine, resonant in your soul, that's going to help you to use the faith rest drill. Point number one, you see the Christian soldier, that's you, that's me, that's us, every born again Christian, the royal family of God, every member. The Christian soldier, what is he going to do? The Christian soldier picks up his or her own shield. Well, if you're picking up your shield, you've got faith three, you've got faith one, you've got faith two, you put those together, and now you have the shield of faith. See, that's, that's your shield that will block all of the fiery darts that are coming at you. So what we need to realize here is the Christian soldier picks up his or her own shield. I can't pick up your shield for you. You don't live out of my soul. You live out of your soul. You don't live out of your husband's soul. You live out of your, your, you live out of your own soul as a wife. You, you live out of your own soul as a, as a neighbor. You live out of your own soul as a grandma. You live out of your own soul as a grandpa. If you're a great grandchild, you live out of your own soul. Whoever you happen to be, are you a president? You live out, out of your own soul. Are you a security guard? You live out of your own soul. Who are you? As a born again Christian, as a believer, you must pick up your own shield. And you're going to, you're, what you're going to do is picking up your own shield is accomplished by metabolizing doctrine. And that's exactly what you're doing. But this is why I said earlier take a look not at yourself. Don't look in the mirror now. Just look out. Look out into society and ask yourself if that's what's happening out there. No, they're not picking up the shield. They're trying to tear yours down. Point number two, the Christian soldier must carry his or her own shield, that's you and me, carry your own shield, and when in contact with the enemy, what do you mean in contact with the enemy? That's when someone's lying to you. That's when somebody's hating you. <laughs> that's when somebody is, is fighting with you physically emotionally, mentally. This is when someone's stealing from you. See, the Christian soldier must carry his or her own shield and when in contact with the enemy. See, you have to know the enemy and identify the enemy when the enemy attacks. You have to identify what's happening. Is it something mental? Is it emotional? Is it physical? How's that attack coming at you? 
See, one of the problems in the in the Vietnam War is that they could not identify the enemy. They all looked alike. And this is why it was so difficult to identify the enemy. We have to be able to identify the enemy. And in our case, you identify the enemy when you see what is being said, what is being felt, what is being done toward you, toward others. Now you can see who the enemy is. And each believer then must use his or her own shield. Now, let me point out something. You and I may be standing side by side. And somebody comes up to us and attempts, well, let's just say they come up and they malign us. They're lying, they're lying to us. They're threatening us. How about that? They're threatening us. You and I are standing side by side, and here comes this person who's just going to come up here and malign us. They're going to threaten us. Now, there are two of us standing there. One of us has on the shield of faith. We have on our, we have our shield on. One of us does, and the other one doesn't. The one is calm in that situation. The other one is frightened to death. Which one of them had the shield of faith on? See, the Christian soldier must carry his or her own shield. And when in contact with the enemy, each believer must use his or her own shield. So when you're looking tomorrow, for example, when you're facing tomorrow, what is happening out there? What, what, what's taking place? What's going on in your mind? I'm talking to people, listen, I'm talking to people throughout a day, depending on where I am, I'm talking to people. I walk out of the house, I meet somebody in the street, we begin to talk about this. And I begin to get a feel for where that person is. And what I'm indicating to you here is this is the angelic conflict. It is very real. And the pressure is going to ramp up unbelievably. And perhaps even by the time I'm out of here, I'm in my sixth year of my second 80. So by the time I'm gone from here, who knows what it's going to be like out there? Now let's come back to reality. I don't know how long I have left. I don't know how long you have left, but I know this, it isn't going to get better. And it's going to get worse day by day by day by day. And at this point in time, it doesn't make any difference what the color of your skin, what your educational background, how much money you make, where you live. You are required to wear your own shield. You must be experientially righteous. You must put on the helmet of, we'll talk about that in a minute. But every soldier must carry his or her own shield. What that means is you're carrying Bible doctrine raised in your soul. You have manifested faith to believe it. And now you're waiting, if not have already applied doctrine. And the next circumstance that comes along, you've got to do the same thing. And if you don't, I was doing something and preparing a lesson for out here, maybe a 15, 20, 30 minute lesson someday. When I have the time, I'm going to come up here and I, listen, it might be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It might be 10 o'clock and I don't know when it'll be. But I will record it and put it out on Facebook. I will put it out there somewhere so that when you have time, you can go out there and you can get it. But it talks about the condition of a, a Christian who is a loser in life. The losing Christian. A Christian loser. That means you lose your salvation. But it's a Christian, and what happens to the Christian? What, what, is it, what is it like to be a Christian who is losing the battle? So the Christian soldier must carry his or her own shield, and when the contact with the enemy, each believer must use his or her own shield. And Christian soldiers, at you and me, we hold our own shield. Why? For the purpose of defending ourselves against Satan's attack. See, I can't defend you against Satan. You can't defend me. I can't defend my wife. I can't defend my children. You can't defend your neighbor. You can defend you and you alone. And that's why every born again Christian, no matter who they are, how old they are, they need to learn to handle their own life, handle their own sword, handle their own shield. Now, when that happens, listen, this is time to stop and ask ourselves, is this, is this what's happening in our, in our society today? 
How many Christians you know that are carrying their who are carrying their shield and defending themselves in, in, in a godly kind of a way? You see, the super grace Christian, super grace Christian's a soldier, functioning in spiritual self-esteem, spiritual autonomy, and maximum spiritual maturity, that's spiritual adulthood. So the super grace believer, the super grace Christian, who's a soldier for God, functioning in spiritual adulthood is standing firm, verse 14. See, back in verse 14, we're told to stand firm. Well, how do you do that? Standing firm is actually, see, you could stand firm in babyhood, maybe one or two times. I, you know, you, you've got just enough doctrine. If you knew what knew how to apply that, you could stand firm in that instance. As you grow to spiritual and through spiritual adolescence, you're gaining more capacity. But by the time you get to spiritual self-esteem, you have enough doctrine now to be able to stand firm no matter how bad the winds blow. Now, you see, there were three categories, categories of faith that we talked about. Faith one, faith two, and faith three. Faith one is faith that believes. Faith two is faith that applies. And faith three is the body of doctrine to be believed. Well, what is the body of doctrine to be believed? Well, it's the principles found in the Word of God. It's the promises found in the Word of God. It's the doctrines that are found in the Word of God. It's techniques that are found in the Word of God. And it's rules for living. Principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, rules for living. And let me point out something. For years, I'm going back, I don't know how long it's been, but going back years, when I first heard my mentor back then, Bob Thiem, talking about Bible promises, talking about the faith rest drill, you need to claim a promise. Well, at that point in time, he's talking about all the promises in the Bible. I said, good grief. When you read Hebrews chapter 4, 1, let us therefore fear, lest a promise that being left us of entering into his rest. Wait a minute. We saw that last night. Well, if I need a promise, I need a pertinent promise, a promise related to the circumstance of life. And back then, about it's been about 1963 or 73, 74, 75, somewhere back in that period of time. I'm hearing talk about the faith rest drill, about the promises of God. And I said, oh, wow, I need to get some promises. And so I go to the Baptist bookstore. I get a book. Oh, there's the book. A hundred promises of God. A matter of fact, it's entitled All the Promises of God. And I begin to look at that thing and I said, wow, look at all these, man. I'm, I'm trying to read all these and understand them. These are verses of scripture. And I said, wow, wow, wow. But the longer I read those, I'm saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is being told us is a promise from God, is not a promise from God, it is a principle. And a principle and a promise are the same. So when you when you are looking for a promise and you're looking for the pertinent promise and you're being told this principle is a promise, but it's not a promise, it isn't going to work in that situation. So what I'm indicating to you is not my former mentor, but I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to indicate to you that many times you're being told this is a promise when in fact it's not a promise at all, it is a principle. And if you need a promise and don't know what the promises are and you're trying to apply a principle there, it doesn't work. What are you going to do? So for years, I, in my own mind, I'm saying, just a second, we're being told that these are, these are promises, but these are not promises. Really, they are principles. And lo, I'm talking about this today, thinking about it today, and I found an article that indicated the very fact that what I have believed all these years was true in the sense that somebody else is saying the same thing that you need to be able to distinguish a promise from a principle. So what I might do then is I might take this article and I might come out and use that as a 15 minute kind of a deal, share that with you so that you can narrow your understanding 
for correctness to be able to distinguish a principle from a promise. Because in the faith rest drill, what you need is a promise. You need to claim a promise that God has made to you that's a guarantee that if you do this, here's what he's going to do. So the body of doctrine to be believed, what is that? Principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, and rules for living. Now, point number five, the effectiveness of faith is always related to the written word or the living word. See, now listen, the, the effective, effectiveness of faith. Faith demands an object. For years ago, again, somewhere along the line, someone told me, I said, well, that's right. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a leap into the light. So we've been accused as Christians over the years, we've been accused of leaping into the dark because people don't believe the word of God. So they say, oh, that's a, no, that's not right. That's not the Bible. No, that's filled with, uh, no, that's not, in, that's not good at all. So they're demeaning the word of God. And so they say to you, oh, no, you see, you have faith, no faith, no, you, what you need is science. You need something else. Faith, yeah, they just believe in something. No, you need science out there. Scientific, listen, we're hearing that right now. And we're being lied to about things that are going to take place after January the 20th, some things that are going to take place out there based on science, but that's just foolishness also. They're lying to us. Global warming, for example. They're going to be messing with a, with a pipeline. They're going to be messing with fracking. They're going to be messing with all these things. And they're telling, oh, yeah, science this, science that. Oh, hey, about the vaccine out here. We're being lied to. And you have to know the truth. And you don't know the truth. You don't get the truth just because I tell you. But when you understand the facts and the spirit of God said, yep, yeah, yeah, that's right. Now you have it. We don't need to believe in these lies. We don't need to be believing spiritual theories out here that can't be proven, where the, you can't connect the dots. So here this, here's the issue, the effectiveness of faith. If faith is going to work, it's always related to one of two things, either the written word, and here it is, there's the written word. So your faith demands an object. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a, faith is a leap into the light. So we have, if you're going to have faith, if you're manifesting faith, it will always have an object. But if the object is not the word of God, if the object is not Jesus Christ, we're in trouble. So faith is not effective unless the, unless the object of our faith is either the written word of God, a principle, a promise, a doctrine, a technique, or a rule for living, or the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You see, now listen, the, in, the written word of God, see, effect, faith to be effective is always related, first of all, we say to the written word. Now, when I say first of all, that's just the way I have this ordered. Jesus is first for your salvation, understand that. But in the way I've written this, I've written the, the written word first. So the effectiveness of your faith is always related either to the written word or the living word. Let's talk about the written word. What is the written word? Now listen, I've taught this in the past. I don't know when the last time I taught this, but I know that I have taught it. What is the word of God? The word of God is the inspired, inerrant, infallible original documents. Listen to what I just said. I didn't say the King James Version. I didn't say the New American Standard. I didn't say the living Bible. I didn't say the message. I didn't say something else. I said the word of God is the inspired and errant and fallible original documents. That's the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. It's the letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians. It's the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. It's the gospel of Matthew. It's the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John. It's the book of Genesis. It's Leviticus. It's Numbers. It's 1 Samuel. Though those books were written, there were original documents, and the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, we call it the Bible, 
But the King James Version is not the inspired and errant infallible uh, Word of God. And I'm telling you right now, if anybody out there that believes that, hears me, I will be criticized, I will be ridiculed, and I will be thrown out of something. Because to many, the King James Version is the, is the, is the only version of the Bible that can be trusted. Not so. The inspired and errant and fallible Word of God is only the original documents. Now let's talk about and, and by the way, every one of them are lost. So let's talk about the inspired Word. If the, if the Word of God is the inspired Word of God, what does inspired mean? It means that God the Father is decisively the author of those 66 books. Now, a man, a man might have come along and written them, but it was God the Father behind all that, God the Father's plan. It was, it was a, a voice from heaven that was speaking. It was a voice that they heard. It was a, a revelation that they heard. It was something else that happened that gave them. But God is behind it all. God was behind Genesis all the way to Revelation. So inspired means God the Father is decisively the author. Now, here's the issue. All original manuscripts have been lost. That means from Genesis to Revelation, we don't have one book that was an original, not one. But be careful. You're going to be told that because of that, and it'll be, it'll be a lie, that because of that, we don't know what the Word of God says. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. Because there are ways that that Word of God has been put together again so that we can, through the Spirit of God, we can know this is true. So inspired means God the Father is decisively the author. What about inerrant? Inspired in an errant word of God. The word inerrant means that all that the Bible affirms is true. If God says, it, 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 that's true. If God says, it, 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 that's true. If God says, it, 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 that's true. Everything that the Bible affirms, everything that it says is true, is true. The Bible is fully true fully truthful. The Bible is trustworthy. It is reliable. That's what it means to be inerrant. It also means that the Bible is without any mixture of error. There's not an error here, an error there, an error someplace else. And by the way, the next word is infallible. And the word infallible means it's without error. It means the original manuscripts in the original language was perfect. It means we do, and here's the issue, we do not have the originals for comparison. So when you're reading the King James Version, when you're reading the NSB, when you're reading the, the Living Bible, when you're reading J.B. Phillips translation, we don't have the originals to compare against. But what we know is this, they, the original manuscripts were without error. And what we need to realize is when you're reading the NSB, NESB, when you're reading the King James Version, when you're reading the Phillips Translation, when you're reading some other version of the Bible, you might look out here at six versions of the Bible. People have come to me and said, Dr. Jim, what I need a Bible. What should I buy? And it's like I'm going to say, oh, yes, if you, whoop, you need this. No, I can't do that. What I have to say is, what are you looking for? If you're looking for flower language, oh, you're looking for the, uh, the uh, I justice not doeth this of it. If that's what you're looking for, buy the King James Version. If you want some translation you can read and, and understand in clear English, then buy the J.B. Phillips, buy the Living Bible, buy the Good News. If you want the if you want the the Bible that that translates most literally from the English, from the Greek into the English or the Hebrew into the English, you buy the New American Standard Bible. There's the Revised Standard Version. There's a, hundreds of Bibles out there, different versions. But it's the original manuscripts that are infallible, inspired, and inerrant. But over the years, we've been able to put the Bible together where we can, we can apply we can say this is what God is intending for us to understand today. Now that's the living that's the that's the living Bible. 
the living word of God, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, it was the, um, uh, we're, the written word is what we're talking about, inspired, inerrant, and infallible. But also the object of your faith, if it's not the written word of God, it must be the living word of God. And what's the living word? It's Jesus Christ. Now let's look, let's look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There's two more things for us. There are two more pieces of armor, equipment for you and me. Put on the whole armor of God. So the next thing in verse 17 is we're going to put on the helmet of salvation and secondly, the sword of the spirit. And what is the sword of the spirit? It is the word of God. Now let's actually pull that verse apart. The first word is chi, and, K-I in the Greek. It means and, but it also means also. So you're going to take, you're going to take up uh, the, the previous in verse uh, 15 and 16. You're going to put on certain parts of your armor. And also, also now, you're going to take. Now, also take the helmet of salvation. That word take means, it means take it, but it means receive it. It means welcome it. So also take the helmet of salvation. And in the, uh, in the meaning here of the helmet of salvation, this refers, and it's a reference to spiritual salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of spiritual salvation. Spiritual salvation is the kind of salvation you have when you were delivered from hell and the lake of fire. This is what you receive, spiritual salvation, when you believe in Jesus Christ. So we're to take the helmet of salvation, and in addition, also now, we're gonna take the sword of the spirit, but the word sword there is makaira, and I wish, I wish, I wish, I, ha I have a makaira sword and two days ago, I began to look for it. I think I probably put it in a place where I, where I won't be able to lose it. I just don't know where I put it now. And I wanted to take a picture of that thing because many, many years ago, probably about back about 1975, 76, I was teaching a, uh, we were, we had a, uh, we had sort of like a, a small seminary in Conway at, at uh, Harlan Park Bible Church where Gene Cunningham was the pastor. And I was assigned theology. So I'm teaching through Lewis Berry Shaver's systematic theology. And during that series of lessons, Gene showed me a Makaira sword that he had that was made by, by someone up in, I think it was in Plummerville, Arkansas. He told me the name of that man, and I was I was absolutely an, an enamored by this thing. It was beautiful. I said, Gene, I'd like to have a Makara sword. He said, well, here, call this guy. So I called the man. He said, certainly I'll make one for you. So he began, he, he did, he took the steel, he began to grind it and grind it and grind it. I didn't see it, he was, I just, he told me what he was doing, he showed me what he was gonna do. And when he got done, there is this beautiful Makaira sword about 18 inches long. Ooh, it was sharpened on both sides. It had a fantastic point and a nice little handle. I had it, I was gonna take a picture of it and put it in our notes, but right now I can't find it. It's, uh, I put it away somewhere, so wouldn't lose it, but I can't find it. You ever done anything like that? Well, I'm sure you have. But if I ever find it again, I will show you what that is, but there was a, there are some pictures, that, but some of the Makairas that they're, put, uh, they're showing out there, it doesn't look like this. But here's what it is. The Makaira is a special sword, and we're gonna talk about that. It's a special sword, and he says, what we're going to do is put on the helmet of salvation that you need to be saved, okay? You need to have the gospel. So as an ambassador, when you go out, you'll be able to share the gospel. But in addition to that, you're going to put, you're going to take this sword of the spirit that is the Makaira, not of the spirit. It's the Makaira from the spirit. And the, the Makaira, your sword is in fact, look what it says. It says the sword of the, the sword from the spirit. And what is it? Which is the word of God. So the sword 
of the Spirit is actually the Word of God. Where do you get the Word of God? It comes from the Spirit. What happens? I teach the Word of God, comes through the ear gate, eye gate, tackling, into the frame of reverence. You're clean before the Lord. It goes straight down into the human spirit, and the Holy Spirit then begins to work on that, on that information, that gnosis information. And if, when he begins to work on it, it becomes pneumaticus. So it goes from gnosis in the Bible, gnosis into the right lobe. It becomes pneumaticus down here in the, uh, in the human spirit. The Holy Spirit's working on it. He sends that back up into the frame of reference. You say, yes, I see it. I understand it. I believe it. Gnosis information then trans transferred into, converted into pneumaticus, now becomes epinosis information that goes down onto the launching pad. So here's the issue. You take up the helmet of salvation, but in addition to that, you take and you you take up, you receive the sword of the spirit, the Machiah from the spirit, and the sword of the spirit. What is it? Which is the Rhema of God. It is the word of God. So the sword of the spirit is the word of God. But notice here something about that word word. The spirit, the spirit, or the sword from the spirit, which is the Rhema from God. Let's translate this for just a moment. The translation of verse 6, 17, and receive the helmet, which, reserves, which refers to being spiritually saved, and also receive the sword of the spirit, which is, the, which is doctrine from God. So you're going to receive spiritual salvation. You're going to receive the word of God. They're called the helmet, and they're called the sword of the spirit. Now, let's take a look here for just a moment. Offensive, be, uh, e offensive equipment for believers. See the sword, the um, the um, uh, your your shield of faith. See that's defensive. You don't take that and beat somebody over the head with it. Oh, you could, but the the shield of faith, the shield is to block incoming harm to your body. So there are defensive weapons and there are offensive weapons. Now what we're going to do, he says, and he says, and take up, take, receive, welcome, and take the helmet. Now here's the issue: the Roman help, the Roman soldier's helmet was a cap, and it was made of thick leather or brass, and it fitted on the head. Now you go back up and take a look at that picture at the top of the page. But the helmet was actually used. What was it used for? It was used to guard the head from a blow by a sword or a war club, or a battle axe. That's why they wore that helmet. Now, as a royal family member, let's talk about you and me. As a royal family member, you put on the helmet when you become saved. See, that's your salvation. You become saved, that is your helmet. So when you become saved, because you are a royal family member, guess what? Now that you're saved, you have the helmet, which means you're saved, guess what? You are now in full-time Christian service at the moment of your spiritual salvation. You were born, see, you were you were actually you were actually drafted into the angelic conflict the moment you were born again, uh, the moment you were born physically. But now as a royal family member, you put on the salvation. And now what happens in the and you're in the in the angelic conflict as an unbeliever, but guess what? Now that you are born again, you are a royal family member and you are in full-time Christian service at the moment you're saved. Again, the helmet of salvation is a reference to being spiritually saved. And here's the issue: no member of the human race, no member of the human race. We're not talking about being saved. No member of the human race can assume the offensive against Satan. See, we need to be on the offensive against Satan. This is the angelic conflict. So we're not going to sit back and wait till he comes to us and say, oh, okay, let's come on here now. When he gets here, when you get here, I'll, I'll defend myself against you. No, 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 no. No member of the human race can assume the offensive against Satan, the ruler of this world, or against mighty demon a mighty demon army, apart from being a member of the royal family of God. It's only members of the royal family of God who are going to be able to defend themselves and go on the offensive against Satan. So here's a spiritual fact. In the age of grace, that's now, 
from the time the Apostle Paul became a born again Christian in Acts 9 to the moment of the rapture of the church. That's right today. Now, in the age of grace, only the believer in Christ is involved in the great spiritual conflict against, against Satan. See, we are, we are in the great spiritual conflict. It is we who are on the offensive. The unbeliever can't do this. It's only the born-again Christian. The unbeliever is in the angelic conflict. They are not in the battle until they become born again. So the moment you became born again, whether you knew it or not, you were, you were, you were actually engaged in this great spiritual conflict against Satan. Satan, the truth of the matter is you can't do anything about it until you have the word of God, and that's why you're here. And when you look outside, get off the mirror, look outside, now you know why the world's in the mess that it's in. And here's the spiritual fact. The unbeliever is on Satan's side in the angelic conflict. Now, again, it says, take up, the, take the helmet of salvation. And there are two categories of salvation. This is something you need to understand. There are two categories of salvation. So when you read the word save, salvation, when you read, read that word in the Bible, you have to ask yourself, just like, are we talking righteousness? Are we talking about positional, experiential, ultimate faith? Are you talking about faith one, faith two, faith three? What are we talking about? This is why doctrine is categorized. So there are two categories of salvation found in the Bible. First of all, eternal salvation. You know what that is. At the moment you're saved, you are saved from eternal condemnation. See, the word salvation actually means delivered. So if you are saved, what are you delivered from? Well, eternal salvation means you're saved from eternal condemnation. Condemnation. You're not condemned. You're not going to hell or the lake of fire. You've been delivered from that. How do you do that? Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved. That's eternal salvation. You will not be condemned. For by grace are you saved, how? Through faith. See, that's where Jesus is the object of your faith. See, our faith is going to have an object. It will either be the living word of God or it will be the written word of God. Here's the living word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What is it? It is a gift from God. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You get it. Salvation, eternal salvation, you get that by a single act of faith in Christ. Now, there is also temporal deliverance, temporal salvation, and that's saved from or delivered from some harm out there in life. This is what David said. David said in Psalm 57, 3, he shall send from heaven, that's God, God will send from heaven and save me from what? David is already saved. He doesn't need saved again. He, doesn't, he already has eternal life. He doesn't need eternal life again. What's happening is he has a problem with somebody else in life. So he said, he shall send from heaven and deliver me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. See, David had a problem with a person. And God is going to deliver him from that. He's not going to save him again spiritually. He's going to deliver him. So what happens in the scripture, when you see the word salvation, you need to ask yourself, is it eternal salvation or is it some type of temporal deliverance? For example, right now, if you find yourself, you're a born again Christian. Let's assume you are. Okay, So you're a born again Christian and you have a circumstance in life where you are under absolute pressure. It is almost tearing you apart. And you say, God, Save me from this. Save me from this. You're not asking to save you again from eternal condemnation. What you're asking him to do is deliver you from that circumstance. So number two, eternal salvation is the primary interpretation of the word salvation in this verse. And he says here, and take up the helmet of salvation. So if you're going to, if you're going to take up the whole armor, you must be saved. So the moment you moment you are born again, at that point in time, you have taken up the helmet of salvation. Okay. So number two, eternal salvation is the primary interpretation of the word salvation in verse 17. However, temporal salvation is a secondary interpretation. And take the helmet of salvation. Now watch. Now you're going to get something else. The next phrase, take the helmet of salvation. You have that. 
and the sword. Now, the word sword here is actually the word makaira. Now, let's talk about the sword for just a moment. Historically, we'll talk about, first of all, the big sword. Now, what is the big sword? Most swords in the ancient world were huge, and no one had thought to use a shorter weapon. So when the when they went to war in, in, in ancient past, they went with swords, and this sword was some long piece of metal. It was huge. And the truth of the matter is, at that point in time, nobody thought to use a shorter weapon. So the big sword was used by barbarians, and what was it? It was four, five, or even times six feet long, and was used to slice an appointment, an opponent. It was used to slice an opponent. Well, interesting enough, when I was when I was involved in taekwondo, we had a sword. We used a sword. And when you would go through the form, you would slice down, you would slice up, you would slice across, you would slice back again. And then you would do other manipulations with it, and then you would thrust with that thing, okay? But the sword that we were using wasn't a makaira; it only had one, it only had sharpness on one side. But you would slice down, slice across, slice down, slice up, and it was slicing. But point three says the armor and the bones of the body of your enemy. So you're slicing with this sword, this long sword. You slice down. And what we discovered is with that long sword, you slice down. All you have to do is miss. And when you miss, somebody else thrusts and puts that sword straight through you, okay? Now, that we weren't doing that in Taekwondo. We weren't killing each other. This was just a form. We weren't not, we didn't have any opponents. We were just learning how to, how to use it. In point number three, the armor and the bones, when you had this big sword, the armor and the bones of the body being sliced would stop most of the blows from killing your enemy. It would cut them, it would slice them, but it wouldn't kill them. But what about the Makaira? The Makaira sword was the basic weapon used in close combat, in close combat by the ancient world's Roman soldier. See, it was the barbarians that had the big sword. But the Romans came along and said, uh oh, no, let, no, let's look, let's get this thing, let's make a small sword here. First time it was ever used. So they make the Machaira sword. That was the basic weapon used in close combat by the ancient world's Roman soldier. And the Machaira sword was about 18 inches long. And that's what mine was. Uh, that's what Jean's was. It was about 18 inches long. It was small, it was short, and had perfect balance. Point number three, it had a good hand guard so that when you were when you were using it, it didn't slip out of your hand. It had two sides. This is amazing. It had two sides. So it's got two sides. It's like a it's like a knife. You probably have a knife in your kitchen. You ladies, you've got a knife in the kitchen. It's sharp on both sides and got a point on the end. Well, that's a very, very short makaira. So the Makaira had two sides that were very sharp with very sharp edges, and it had a point on the tip. Now notice what is what is the Makaira sword? Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrew says it is the uh, Paul tells us it is the word of God. Paul in our verse said it is the word of God. The Makaira sword is the word of God. So your Makaira sword, your word of God, is your Makaira Makaira a sword, okay, for use in your life. Now watch this. Again, it had two sides, very sharp, it had a sharp point. Now listen to Hebrews 4.12. I recite this every time we open a class. Just a moment. I'm about to sneeze. Just a second. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Here's, where, here's what it says in Hebrews 4.12. Remember, the Makaira sword, double-edged sword, got a tip on, point on it. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God, with the logos of God, the word of God, what is it? It is quick. That means it's alive. It's not dead. It's alive. Oh, it's vibrant. The word of God is alive and powerful. 
and sharper, what? The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. See, the Machair sword had two sharp edges on it. And what do you do with it? It had a point on it, and you, whoop, you pierced. So you could swipe with a, down, you could swipe across, you could swipe up, you could swipe down. Either way you went, no matter which way you went, you were able to cut with that, but it had a point on it so that you could pierce with that sword. And we see then the Machaira sword. The word of God is alive and power and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So here it is. You've got this beautiful 18-inch sword, and you're going out to war with the with the Romans, and they're out there on the battlefield, close combat. They got this great big long sword. Somebody is fighting against you. They swipe down, you duck, they miss you, you move in and whoop, you take that point, you put it right through them. With a sharp with a sharp sword. I mean the, the the edges on it. It goes through so easy. It pierces so easy and it cuts as it's going in. Sharp on both sides. Listen to this. You find yourself in battle out here against Satan and all the fiery darts of Satan, and you've got the two-edged sword, the Makar, which is the word of God, and the word of God, no, no matter how much damage you can do in war. In the physical war out there, you take the two-edged sword of the Machair, which is the word of God. You're cutting one way, you're cutting the other, you're piercing with this thing, even to the decide, dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What we want out of that verse is this. The word of God is alive and powerful, and here it is, and sharper than any two-edged sword. So if we think the Makara sword is something, we haven't seen anything until you see the word of God and how it works. I'm out of time. Let me finish this next couple of points here. The Makara sword was used for thrusting. That means whoop, you take it in straight forward. That's the way the word of God does. The word of God, you're not out here just winging around out here. Listen, you take the word of God and whoop, you go right to the point. The Makair was used for thrusting, not cutting like the big sword. When the Makair was thrusted, it went into the enemy's body. It went into the enemy's body organs and was an effective fighting tool. The Makair was the greatest hand to hand combat weapon, weapon before the gunpowder age. I'm sorry. We're out of time. Come back on Wednesday night, pick up with here, and move on from here. We're not quite done yet. What are we going to do? We're going to take up the full armor of God. Why? So that we can have the ability to defend ourselves and to take the offensive against the enemy of Satan. Satan is the enemy. And how is he dealing with this? He's dealing with it through people who have their head on crooked. I pray that between now and next, next Wednesday night, we're still able to be able to get together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of studying your word. I would say right now that the full armor of God is what we need and is what we're going to need. And I pray, Father, we'll use it not in anger, not in bitterness, not in jealousy, not in hatred, but use it objectively against the enemy. Our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against Satan, the, 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 the army of Satan. But the truth of the matter is they're putting all these false principles in the heads of people. So it's the evil that we're battling against. And I pray, Father, that we would understand these things, and I pray that we would be willing to stand straight, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm, as we face tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, God bless you all. I love you all. I'll see you Wednesday evening. Good day.